Okay, so hello everyone. I see the attendees coming and appearing in the screen. Um, thank you everyone for coming. So um, uh, we are together today uh, for this conference about music industry and blockchain organized by Legal Hackers in partnership with the French Cluster, Revive Music, Le Village de la Justice and L'Informaticien Magazine. Legal Hackers is a global movement of lawyers, policy makers, designers, technologists and academics who explore and develop creative solutions to some of the most pressing issues at the intersection of law and technology. French Cluster is a pool of French speaking experts based in the United States. They have extensive knowledge of the American market and want to offer a unique and original alternative to help their community succeed. And Revive Music is an initiative to found six months programs to preserve music diversity and help emerging artists build their own fan base. Uh, we had the chance to have um, very brilliant and amazing experts with us who will help us understand how music industry can leverage the blockchain technology. Uh, I will let Eloi Gérard take it from there. So welcome, Eloi. Oh, thank you, Berenger, for inviting us. Yes, I'm, I am just a moderator of the, this debate and I will uh, introduce the, the people of, the, of that. I just want to to start by uh, maybe emphasis what uh, what I think why I think that uh, NFT and music is important, and I will also quickly introduce myself before introducing everyone in the in the panel. Um, I am um, I'm living in uh, in LA uh, like many people in this panel, and we are um, uh, following a trends in in what's happening in the uh, in the in the blockchain and uh, and. Uh, in the music industry and uh, at large the, the whole uh, creative uh, industry uh, and we see that uh, many um, yeah creators and, and musicians uh, got involved uh, into that field they have plenty of questions they want to understand what is the future where do we go is it important is it something I need to uh, to get involved in uh, what what is it and uh, this is what we are going to try to uh, answer today. Uh, where I come from is uh, to understand why, uh, um, how I can help in, in moderating this debate. I'm uh, uh, actually working in a virtual reality, so I'm more uh, I'm, uh, in the metaverse. We call it metaverse now, thanks to uh, Mark Zuckerberg uh, calling his company Facebook Meta. So now we are uh, using the word metaverse to 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 define these worlds where uh, we are. Uh, uh, doing games, we are listening to music, and we are using uh, the money of the future uh, through crypto and NFT. Uh, so I, uh, my uh, understanding of, uh, of NFTs is more uh, from the virtual reality and the virtual reality game side. I'm a publisher of virtual reality games, so I'm always looking for new games and to publish these games on an interesting platform. I'm always looking for new ideas using NFTs uh, in games. And uh, so this is what I do. So now let me, uh, I suggest that we, we go through uh, uh, everyone in this panel. Uh, happy to see that Pascal uh, could uh, join with a different background, which is way more cool. <laughs> Somehow because he has plenty of cool records. Um, but uh, maybe we can, we can start uh, by uh, Louise Marie to uh, introduce you. So you can maybe explain a bit more who you are and what you do uh, quickly. Yes, uh, hi, so my name is uh, Louise Marie Morgay. Um, my street name is Luma, so a lot of people call me Luma. Uh, I'm the founder of um, Imojam, which is uh, the first music sticker uh, company ever created. Uh, it's like Giphy, but with music and original content. So for instance, I'll, Okay, you have your iMessage up here, right? Like you're in iMessage and now you can send stickers with music. Emojam is a new way for artists to engage and monetize their audience across Web2 and Web3, including games um, and metaverse. And uh, previously, before doing Emojam, I used to work at uh, record labels in New York. I worked for Atlantic Records, Def Jam, Republic Records, and Universal, where I was doing marketing, international marketing, and um, also ECRM. 
Perfect. Thank you so much okay. for having me today, and I'm very excited to uh, join this conversation. Yes. We will come back to your platform to understand more what it is and, uh, and go through that. Uh, Paul, do you think you can quickly introduce yourself? Yes, um, I'm Paul Menace, and what I do is keep everybody else in the conference and my clients out of trouble. Uh, I'm an entertainment lawyer and digital media lawyer. I've uh, been doing that for a long time, um, primarily in music and television. Um, got into digital media back in the late 80s, late 90s, rather, um, because we were uh, helping with one of the first digital delivery services for music. And I've been involved deeply in it ever since and um, have become pretty conversant with NFTs and understand, I think, the benefits and the drawbacks of using them, especially with music. And we'll talk about that today. Yeah, perfect. Yes, it will come back into uh, many of the legal impacts of NFTs and uh, what does it mean for yeah for for music industry and your clients and understand what they are looking for. Yes, uh, Pascal. Hello, great that you could join. Hello, and, uh, so, sorry for the delay. First of all, we found out that uh, I was trying to connect with the wrong email address. I was invited to another email address. That's why the struggle. Anyway. Um, so my name is Pascal Guillon. I'm a music composer and a software developer. I produced a lot of music for lots of people around the world. Um, then I started to be very interested in computers, uh, took tons of uh, programming classes, started to make softwares, um, started to make some games, uh, worked with the uh, Hyperloop Transportation Technologies company made a software for that company. Uh, right now I'm making a, a software in finance. So I'm actually highly interested in research and building proof of concepts. So uh, actually the game I made a few years ago is, uh, is really a subject, a good example of how we, I could implement NFTs in it to make it more interesting. Okay, hey, let's let's talk about let's start by uh, talking about your game to understand how uh, in your uh, amazing career and all the different things that you've done, you know, uh, that uh, that give you like this uh, this very interesting um, uh, vision of uh, of the world uh, from music to your yeah, hyperloop and and uh, and now blockchain. You 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 look at so many different things. Uh, so you uh, the game. So you you, you created a, a kind of game. Uh, uh, online uh, at early step uh, before uh, like uh, everyone uh, how do you think that what was this game and how do you think that this game can help you to now understand what is the trends in in, in nft so basically uh, the game itself was uh, extremely simple but basically as a music composer and software developer i managed to build uh, an audience online and when you have an audience, you're trying to find a way to entertain them with unique experiences. So in 2017, I created a video game that anybody can play online for free. Uh, and here's why I'm thinking about implementing NFTs in the game now. I could make the game extremely hard to finish, which would be motivation for players. And to reward a player who would manage to finish the video game, I could give him a music track I composed that actually never got released. And he would be the only person to have it. So he, it would be pretty much a collectible. And that's exactly what NFTs are actually, digital collectibles. So by transforming my music track into an NFT, which is called minting, the whole process could be totally automated. Meaning as soon as a player would manage to finish my video game, he would be rewarded by getting my music track on his digital wallet. That's how you store NFTs. Then he would be able to keep it as long as he wants, like as a collector, or he could sell it to somebody else and I could get potentially a percentage of every single time it gets sold if I wish to. This is something you set up when you create your NFT. So that's why I'm very interested in that. Okay, okay, we understand why you, 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 you go there. But Pascal, let's go back to the super basics of things. You know, it's like, okay, let's imagine that I have, uh, I, I have just a, a, a barely an understanding of what crypto is about. Yeah. So now, what, what, what the heck is NFT? You know, what, yeah. what is it? Well, how different is this? And um, to to understand how it could be at some point useful for, for you. So let's go back to the basics. What is an NFT? So in basic words, 
uh, an NFT is a digital collectible. It is unique and rare. It can be a picture, a video, piece of music, concert tickets, in-game assets, which data are stored on the blockchain. A public blockchain is a ledger, think like an Excel sheet for people who are like familiar with Excel, that is supposed to be immutable and that anybody can check online. So in the real world, a collectible needs to be identified by experts who deliver certificates of validity. For NFTs, as soon as an NFT is created, all its information, including a unique ID, are stored on the blockchain like Ethereum. It means that anybody can go online and check the correct information about this NFT. It removes the risk of falsification and corruption when dealing with collectibles in the real world because you have to deal with people. So uh, another big advantage for um, any community leaders is that you can unlock uh, unique experiences using NFTs because you store your NFT on a digital wallet. So if you go to a website and it connects to the digital wallet, it could potentially give you access to hidden parts of a website. So if you are a fan, suddenly, I don't know, I'm talking about Steve Aoki, for example, who is a big fan of that stuff. If you have your digital wallet with an NFT from Steve Aoki, you go on his website and suddenly because you own the NFT, you are one of the only person in the world to have access to this hidden part on the website, which will give you a unique experience, maybe some music that nobody has heard yet, or a special video, a special video clip, that kind of stuff. And what I said, uh, as a, which is very interesting as a creator, uh, you can set up your NFT so that you get paid each time it gets sold again and again and again and again. So that's very, very cool, actually. And it doesn't go through other third parties. It's completely automated. It doesn't involve other people. So when it's fully automated like that, it resolves a lot of problems. Okay. Just to, just to understand, sorry, let's imagine I, I don't know much things. Uh, so, for example, I have Spotify and uh, I can download song from Spotify. What is the difference between like downloading a song from Spotify and downloading an yeah. NFT? You see what I mean? How well, the thing is downloading a song from Spotify, anybody can do it. So like, like a, a million people will have the same song. I'm talking about something that is unique. So basically it would be, it's a unique art, a piece art in the examples we're talking about. This is something, there is not, not two of them. This is why fans usually go after. That's what they want. They want a unique piece of their favorite artist. That's what we're talking about. That's the big difference. Okay, okay. So, okay. It's a unique proof of, uh, of uh, uh, ownership of uh, a song or of any asset or creative asset. Okay, yeah. we can, okay, perfect. Um, Maybe we can uh, go to, uh, uh, people will have, of course, occasion to, to ask questions. You can ask questions in the chat and we'll have a, a little Q&A uh, after. Uh, but uh, maybe we can go to, to your platform, Luma. Uh, I use, I, I love your street name. I think it's super cool, uh, Luma, uh, to uh, uh, explain a bit more. Okay, what, so what is it? I, so I, I tried it, I, I love the ID, uh, so that you can uh, uh, use, um, a music or a song as an emoji. So I, of course I love to use emoji with my friends and in my groups and say, hey, blah, blah, blah. Uh, this is cool to, to simplify an idea or to, uh, to uh, evoke a very simple concept. And, uh, and you created this super cool platform where instead of uh, sending emoji, you can send a piece of music that would be related to the conversation. So it's a very different way to, to, to relate socially between people and, to, and to, uh, to have a conversation. Can you can you share a bit more about why do you have this idea? Why do you think it can be big and what is it? Yes, uh, absolutely. So it came, uh, it, it started as almost like a work frustration, uh, working at um, uh, record labels when we were promoting uh, new albums most of the time. We would send newsletter to fans. Uh, and as you can imagine, uh, Gen Z and millennials, they don't really you know, check their emails or every promo emails go straight to the junk or the spam. However, we spend 91% of all our time on mobile texting. And therefore, from a marketing perspective, if you're an artist, what you want is to have your music uh, in day-to-day -day conversation where the fans are. 
The thing is the messaging ecosystem is a very private ecosystem. You can't do push ads the same way as you can do on social media. You can't buy keywords uh, like you can do on Google. However, there is a format uh, that is beloved by everybody and that is interoperable across platform. And this is the emoji, the GIF and the sticker format. There is billions of emoji uh, since every day, 70% of conversation on uh, Facebook Messenger contains the stickers or a GIF. And therefore this is such a like, you know, language that is beloved by everybody that we decided that it would be smart to actually, you know, attach a short snippet of audio uh, to a custom uh, emoji that reflects the imagery of an artist. And so it's an organic way for an artist to join the conversation and also enable people to better express themselves when we communicate, because we all know that music is the ultimate language of emotion. So it started as like a marketing uh, solution for artists until that uh, YouTube find out about us during the pandemic. And they were very interested about our solution to enable YouTube creators uh, to, uh, of course, join fans conversation, uh, but also uh, generate additional revenue through months, through monthly subscription. So we actually started working on the exclusivity and this, you know, concept of scarcity uh, with YouTube, where uh, we offered exclusive um, audio stickers behind the paywall. So the fans pay monthly to unlock exclusive uh, audio stickers. And it's a model that works so well. Uh, we see that we have 10% of the diehard fans who monthly pay uh, to use audio stickers. We see some uh, YouTube creators generating up to $6,000 every month just from Emojam. And therefore we were able to demonstrate that this is a form of digital merchandising. Now, if you add an additional level of scarcity, uh, then it's a perfect format for NFTs. And it also, you know, enabled the NFTs to enter the mainstream because people see your immediate utility uh, for uh, the NFT and being the Emojam. Most of the time, people think that when you have an NFT, it stays on your wallet. Uh, but with the Emojam, you can actually use this Emojam NFTs in your day-to-day -day conversation as a way to flex your ownership or as a way uh, to also better convey your emotion. Hmm. So, so you, uh, do, do, your idea is to implement NFT into your platform very soon, or it's already the case right now? It's already the case. So uh, we did our first drop with a uh, basketball player, Baron Davis, uh, who also happened to raps. Uh, and we have upcoming drops. Um, actually, maybe, you know, it's going to be a teaser, but uh, we dropped the last week of June uh, a collection of uh, music stickers and NFTs for Silo Green. And we have upcoming uh, releases as well uh, scheduled for the summer. I see that there is a question from Alain Charbonnier. So I'm going to read it and answer. Uh, so as an artist, how much do I need to invest if I want to create an NFT for my album? So maybe we should we should uh, uh, answer because because it will come in the conversation okay, later. Uh, no I think uh, as a very valid question that we we have in the in the in the in the panel, so it's perfect. We will talk about, about that. I thank you, Alain, for for that. Uh, it's super cool. Uh, yes, we will come back to that. Uh, I will uh, maybe continue with the with the poll. So thank you for your yeah for for helping us to understand what what it is. I I love the idea. I can I imagine that what you are doing. Yeah, I could easily integrate uh, nfts it's, it's a it's a bold uh, concept that uh, I, I can imagine would could be very successful and super cool um, yeah uh, 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 but let's continue to pull to give a, a, a better understanding of the the whole music industry and and uh, what's uh, uh, what's in it for you know what what NFT could could, could do also because uh, Paul you have of course as a lawyer you have a, 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 a huge expertise into uh, into the, the delivery of music and how what are the different platform and uh, I guess you help clients in that field um, so I would like to know so uh, you've seen you've seen an evolution in, in Hollywood and in and, and, and the states moving from from uh, uh, an analog uh, world to a, a full digital world what are right now the 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 big delivery uh, platform for music and how do you see that NFT could at some point uh, integrate this, uh, the, 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 the delivery side of, of the music? So what to understand for the end consumer, when does NFT will actually impact them, you know? Well, as Luma said, when she was working for the labels, uh, they were trying to figure out ways to engage with uh, the fans of the artists. 
And NFTs look like it's going to be the next iteration of very targeted fan engagement. There's a lot of things NFTs can do related to music. Um, one, uh, Pascala mentioned where you'll get access. You have this NFT to a specific piece of music, this rare collectible. Um, another utilization of it is uh, there's a company called Song Hub. I think Pascal pointed this out to us about a, two weeks ago. Uh, they just started a system called Connect and Create, and it enables creators to register all steps of the creation of a song on the blockchain. And this will supposedly go a long way in alleviating disputes, and there's tons of disputes, about who created the song. I mean, who really participated in the song? It's a more immutable um, version of a split sheet. Uh, and there's a lot of disputes, obviously, uh, a lot of court cases where someone says, wait, I wrote part of that song. I sent, you know, Jay-Z a bridge for him to listen to, or I was in the studio delivering coffee. And I said, wait, let's do a tonic fourth here. Maybe that would be a better idea. And this the NFTs would, and the blockchain would help, I think, do away with a lot of that. Um, also, as uh, Luma, I think, mentioned, um, it's a way for artists and creators to get paid directly without money flowing through a record label, a publisher. And as this collectible is, is sold downstream, uh, it enables that small royalty to continue to be paid. Uh, and it goes right into the digital wallet. And uh, so and on the blockchain, it's very easy to track. Um, another use of NFTs with music isn't just minting a collectible, it's authenticating a physical asset. So, for example, um, you know, concert tickets get uh, counterfeited quite often. If your ticket comes with an NFT, then it's easy to authenticate that it is, in fact, a ticket to that show. Uh, NFTs can uh, open certain opportunities for fans uh, that other fans would not have without the NFT, certain kind of backstage access. You know, maybe studio access to, to, to be the fly on the wall, listening to the, the process of creating the recording. Um, those are, you know, a few I, that I can think of off the top of my head um, about how NFTs are being integrated into music. Um, mm. Also for signed merchandise, this is a really smaller example, but again, it can authenticate some, that, that something is, is real. So for example, let's say an artist wants to share the original handwritten lyrics to a song. An NFT can be minted for that and limited numbers. And then a fan can have an NFT of you know, the origin of this, of this song. I mean, the actual lyrics, you know, written, the, an actual NFT of the written lyrics. They won't get the actual ownership of the lyrics, but they'll have bragging rights in essence and the ability to display uh, you know, maybe put up on their socials or their friends um, that they have this unique one of a kind or maybe, you know, 20 of a kind collectible, um, which then amplifies their connection with the artist and, and their status as a fan. Even people like uh, Jack Dorsey, which, which is a little bit different, the, the creator of uh, uh, Twitter, uh, um, he minted his first tweet. So as an historical event, he's like, hey, here's an NFT of my first tweet ever. And since you know, Twitter is important, Jack Dorsey is important, of course, a lot of people are following, They're like, hey, who wants to? And I think he, 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 he sold it for an insane amount of money. <laughs> That's how this all started with NFTs. There were, like most things, there was a handful of very high priced NFT transactions that got everybody interested. Uh, the other one is the artist Beeple, oh, yeah. who took 10 years of um, his digital art creations, made a huge collage out of it, and sold it at, on Christie's for 69.3 yeah. million US dollars. Hmm. And the person who bought that NFT, and there's only one, didn't actually get the piece of art. He only has an NFT authenticating that he has the rights to this piece of art, but all he can do with it or she can do with it 
is put it in a virtual art gallery online, you know, put yeah. it up on a screen in their house, and hang it on the wall, show yeah. it to people. But, you know, it's that bragging rights thing. It's that having something <laughs> unique and exclusive. Yeah. But not all it, NFTs are valuable. I mean, I think I just read, I think the number was 85 or 90 percent of NFTs are worthless. Uh, and so that's the, the drag about people jumping in with both feet. You have to be careful. You got to understand a little about what an NFT is, how it works, and do your diligence. Figure out if what you're buying is worth it or if you're just kind of like a lemming jumping off a cliff with everybody else. Yeah. Yes. Let's, let's talk about that maybe with uh, Pascal. The, the, the idea that uh, so recently there was a crash in crypto and NFT. Uh, where um, you know, so a lot of value was lost into the, in, the, uh, in this market uh, uh, right now. Do you think it would have an impact on what are you guys doing about NFT and music, or do, do you think it's just like a, a trend or a, a, a short trend, or, or do you think that it's a, a, a long-term thing? Uh, should we be worried about that? Well, the crash itself is nothing new. I think it's the eighth. Uh, crash in Bitcoin. I mean, it's really, really normal. Uh, plus, because of macro circumstances, all the markets, I mean, the stock market as well was up like crazy. So everybody was speculating like they never ever done before. That was pretty much absolutely completely nuts. So it's just going back to something a bit normal. It's also due to what the Fed is doing with interest rates. So everybody's going to calm down now. <laughs> Stop speculating like crazy. But at the end of the day, it's definitely, you see it in the art world in general. Um, a lot of people love uh, uh, when they look at contemporary art, for example. A lot of people are wondering why somebody would uh, uh, buy a modern piece of art, contemporary art, uh, buy that a few million dollars, it's just a green square. Where, what is the value of that? It's the same question with NFTs. It's like whatever you are willing to pay for. Like, does it make any? Does it make any sense for you? Um, it's up to people to figure it out. You know, do you think that green square is going to be worth two million dollars in twenty years, or is it just going to become a, a a boring green square that actually is not valued anything. So that's really up to what people are willing to pay for art or collectibles, definitely. You're right. It is. It is just similar. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So maybe it's a good time for me to buy some NFT. Oh no, we don't give any advice to people about that. No financial advice. <laughs> okay. Okay. So let's stay, uh, see. Uh, we could uh, maybe go back to give a, a better landscape of the of the whole industry with Luma. She knows that very well. So, what are the the big company? What are, who are the big players in in that field in NFT and music right now? Do you know what what are the who are the company we should we should look at? What, what what's happening now? Yeah. Yes, uh, absolutely. So I'm sharing my screen right now. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay, awesome. So um, this is a post uh, that was made by this guy, uh, Koopa Troopa, that can is kind of like now like a reference to kind of look at the landscape of um, the music NFT. So what is very important to understand is that, you know, the NFT is a digital asset, right? But so on the back end side, it's handled by, you know, Web3 music company. Uh, and on the front end, uh, it's, uh, you know, the NFT can be used or can have utilities across multiple platforms. So this landscape, really, you know, kind of like show how you could use your NFTs or who or, or how you can create those NFTs. So for instance, uh, um, I think, you know, what you may uh, want to uh, focus on on these slides um, in this company called Royal. Uh, that enables any artist to actually, you know, sell their music as NFTs. Of course, artists can sell their music as NFTs on uh, other platforms like Rarible or OpenSea, but I would say that Royal really focus on uh, royalties, which is something that is uh, very important uh, for uh, music. And then you can see, you know, other cool uh, company here, like uh, Friends with Benefits, uh, which is a collective collective of uh, people uh, that you know own uh, some uh, NFTs. So because everything can be an NFT, you also have like the entire ecosystem uh, that can be dedicated and focused on uh, you know creating NFTs or developing new application uh, in, in uh, use case those NFTs. 
Okay, it is way bigger than I uh, imagined. Uh, ah, it's a big industry. <laughs> you know, basically, Web3, it's the future of the internet. So everything, you know, all the, the number of companies basically that were happening in Web2 uh, that can be translated into Web3. Okay, and because you know the landscape also, uh, geographically, where, where, where is all these companies being focused? Do you think LA is a great place where you are to, to talk to these people? What, or is there like a city in the world where you have more, um, yeah, more companies in NFT and music? It, it, it's, a, it's a very um, uh, interesting thing that uh, you're saying. I would say that um, there is a combination of elements that, you know, between the pandemic where people left those uh, big cities and, uh, you know, kind of like the envy to escape um, the tax system, uh, you have a lot of Web3 companies and crypto companies that have emerged um, in cities where you have uh, no taxes. So I would say, you know, Austin is becoming a big place for music NFTs. Uh, Miami, uh, as well as like uh, Puerto Rico, there is a big crypto community uh, out there. LA, of course, for, you know, I would say the, 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 the recording and, 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 and the artistry, um, but definitely, you know, some of the biggest um, music NFT company that happen to be uh, either in New York, San Francisco, uh, Miami, uh, Austin. Okay, so uh, all in the US, in Europe, we, we don't have... Mostly in the, well, it, it's just like I work mostly with the US, uh, so I don't necessarily know a lot about what's going on in, in, in Europe. Um, the US is kind of like always driven. Uh, but, you know, for instance, we work with Rarible, they have people in, um, in the Netherlands. Uh, so Web3 is a global market, right? I would not necessarily attach this to any cities. Uh, uh, Web3 and NFT takes place in the blockchain. And yes. the blockchain is international. Absolutely. It's a global uh except in China, where I used to live. Uh, but uh, yes, um, I, I see what you mean. And uh, yeah, okay, per country, I know we, everything is a bit uh, different also uh, legally, and this is Paul, where, where you, you, could, you could come up here is to uh, understand uh, what is the, now, so if I understand that uh, the NFT is uh, uh, a proof of ownership of something, of a, of a digital uh, concept, of a digital creative asset, uh, uh, what is the status now legally of that? You know, this, can we say that an NFT is equivalent to copyright in the United States? I suppose it's different per country, and probably some countries are more advanced than others. Uh, but uh, what is the legal status of an NFT now? Right now, it's all over the place because technology happens a lot faster than the law does. But one way to look at it is to look at it like an analog asset as opposed to a digital asset, because the issues are the same. It's all about the rights. What are you getting? What do you have? And what can you do with it? So hmm. if you want to create NFTs of somebody else's uh, music, uh, you have to get the rights from that person to create the NFTs because the, the bundle of rights that goes with owning a piece of music includes the right to make copies of it, and the right to make what are called derivatives of it, which is something new that is based on or contains a piece of the original. So um, that's a very important consideration. There's a lot of lawsuits now about um, whether some uh, NFTs were created with or without consent. Um, there's, a, you know, most contracts for music uh, are old. Uh, they predate NFTs, and so they don't provide for who in that contract retains or got the rights that could be construed to include NFT rights. So that's something that is also part of being careful and part of understanding or being cautious. So I'm a very practical lawyer. You know, the law is a lovely thing and it puts people to sleep when lawyers talk about it. But at the end of the day, you gotta be practical about it. So you, you have to be careful when dealing with NFTs to make sure that what you're getting is authentic. And if you're minting the NFT that you have the rights to, if you've created a piece of music, no problem. Uh, unless you have a publisher that automatically owns 50% of it controls what you can do with it. Yeah. But that's one of the biggest legal issues is you know, what can you create it? And then once you create it and, and it's out there, who's responsible for downstream payments? 
Yeah, so you have collaborators and you have, um, you've had collaborators. Is it your obligation when money comes in on the blockchain for people acquiring the NFT or reselling the NFT? Uh, are you responsible for paying the collaborators? Is the person acquiring the NFT responsible for paying the collaborators? That's a function like most things of contract. And it's very important that the contract, the smart contract, which is neither smart nor a contract, by the way, uh, but it does govern the NFT. And it's important to have in there who's responsible for what, what rights you have. Um, also, if you're getting an NFT off of a platform, when you're getting an NFT off a platform, it's real important. You got to look at the terms of use, the terms of service, because that will tell you a lot about what actually are you getting, what actually can you do with it. But because it's such a wild west sort of mentality, uh, use another analogy, it's a land grab. So that's why there's all these lawsuits because you know, people are claiming they have rights to things that other people don't necessarily agree to. And so now that stuff's getting sorted. But if you don't wanna get involved in a lawsuit, do due diligence. Talk to somebody who knows about this side of NFTs and you know, make sure what you're paying for is what you're getting and what you can do with it is what you're allowed to. For, for you, you, Pascal, for him, I, I know you, you, you have also uh, quite great uh, uh, expertise into that and you are French. So what do you see? What is the debate in Europe about that? Uh, maybe you, you, you know a bit better on what's happening in France or outside of the US uh, about that. Do, do, do you have any idea about that? I think I don't know specifically about France, but I think it's exactly what Luma was saying. <clears throat> I think the last two years, because of what happens the last two years, because of everything happening in technology, Web3, crypto, NFTs, uh, we are seeing people actually much more free to go wherever they want and pretty much doing whatever, yeah, whatever they want, wherever they want. So I came to Los Angeles as a French person to be around my heroes, which happened awesome, but now they're all gone. <laughs> Actually, yes. no, seriously, everybody just went away. Everybody realized that more than ever, you didn't need to be in a specific location to make something happen. And because of these new technologies, this is just ampl amplifying that. So, that's what I'm seeing. And it's global, absolutely global. Maybe not in China, like you said, but. <laughs> it is, yes, okay. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah, it makes sense. We are now all working remotely and we can all collaborate on that kind of things. I have friends working for NFT yeah. games and they are a purely remote team worldwide, including China, actually. Yeah. So, uh, it's like, um, yeah, I understand that it's, it's very- I, I can mention uh, regarding smart contracts and NFTs, actually the first platform for music streaming blockchain related stuff I used uh, was called MusiCoin. And the smart contract, uh, when you were registering the smart contract, yes, you were saying, okay, 20% is gonna go to that person, 10% is gonna go to that person, 5% is gonna go to that person. And as soon as, as long as the, the, the song was streamed, these, the payment was triggered and everybody was getting paid uh, instantly, basically. And everybody could also uh, check the payments on the blockchain. So that's huge because as a composer, when I check my royalty statements, I have no idea what's going on. Like, I don't know where it comes from. I have pretty much no way to verify that this is correct. I usually just see that, oh, great. I have $0.00035 from this. I, I cannot verify it. I have no idea. But with these smart contracts and NFTs depend on that, of course, you can go and check. You're like, oh yeah, okay. This is why, because of this person. And actually now I can interact with that person. I know exactly who that was. So that's huge improvements for our industry. That's the magic of the whole thing, of course, yes. Uh, uh, maybe we should uh, go to the question of Alain and um, uh, now and, and talk more to musicians and creators with Luma where we can be like, okay, what, I am a musician, I'm a composer uh, right now. I don't know much about NFT. What, what should I do about, how, how could, could I get involved? Uh, what, 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 how much would it cost? Uh, what, 
so what is my step to to understand and to start monetizing my art with NFTs? Luma. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, so uh, first of all, just you know, if we think about like uh, the music uh, itself. Um, the artist needs to think about like how many uh, copies of uh, the NFTs uh, he wants to offer. It can be uh, one or it can be uh, multiple. The only cost that he has uh, to release music as NFTs or um, the minting fees uh, when he uh, kind of like, you know, publish like you know, publish is uh, NFT. So the NFTs are driven by fandom access and scarcity. So we just talk about the scarcity piece of it, meaning like how many copies of, you know, his music is going to uh, sell uh, to his fans. Then when you create an NFT, what also um, is important is access uh, and fandom. So about access is, okay, what rights do you give uh, to uh, the NFT owners? Do you give them the rights to, you know, uh, use uh, your uh, music for, uh, you know, any business endeavors or not? And then you can also, you know, just decide like, um, you know, any additional rights about the, the, the music. So that's the access. And then uh, the, the, the fandom is about the community. So what is very important in order to have a successful uh, drop of music NFTs uh, is to start building a community, a Web3 community on platform uh, such as uh, Discord. So you really have like, you know, educated your fans about why you are doing this NFT project uh, and uh, what are all the utilities that will come along with that. Uh, and then, uh, yes, as I was saying, you know, I think the best place uh, for an artist to get started with music NFTs is a platform like Royal. Um, but if they want to do something much more like mainstream and don't necessarily need to, you know, really focus about the, on the royalties, then uh, I would recommend to use, you know, platform like Rarible or OpenSea. Okay, all of that. And uh, so this is, this is about, uh, yeah, uh, uh, NFT as a as a as a proof of ownership for for music itself, but uh, uh, everybody's talking also about collectibles and uh, and uh, uh, to use NFT as a um, as a unique piece of like um, uh, a derivative of, of the of the music itself. Uh, mm -hmm. Can can you talk about what? So for example, I'm a I'm a I'm a concert manager. Uh, you know, I'm a, uh, uh, I'm. You know, I, I yes, I, I work around around music. I'm not a musician myself, but, I, but how how could I also get involved into uh, creating NFT around a band or around a, a, a something that, as a collectibles? What do you think about that? Yeah, so while well, collectible just kind of like imply this like a scarcity and a rarity elements, meaning like it's the finite numbers uh, of a product that you're selling. So yes, in that case, again, like the music uh, can be an NFT itself where you, the creators decide of not, uh, you know, what intellectual proper, uh, um, property about the rights uh, are uh, attached to it. Uh, but you can also, you know, use those collectible as kind of like rare stuff um, to airdrop and reward uh, your collector. And that has been done uh, with merch, uh, early access for future releases, concert tickets, uh, etc. So the, the, the notion of collectible is really much about like the rarity, how much you know, you're, you're going to um, you know, offer. Uh, and then you know, in terms of the content, basically, uh, it can be the music itself, but it can be your album cover, it can be a ticket, uh, it can be anything. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I could like uh, have a specific piece of Blackpink, for example, and uh, because I'm a, I'm a huge fan of Blackpink and um, yes, and keep it and resell it uh, later on. This is the idea. Yes. Okay. Maybe we can go to uh, a little Q&A because I guess we have like, maybe we can have 10 more minutes. And I There is something uh, I, I could mention quickly. This is very, very new, but uh, Vitalik Bitheran, uh the last two weeks started about talking about non-transferable NFTs. Um, basically, it would be used for credentials. So it would be a way to certify, you know, credentials, which is very interesting. He wrote just uh, 16 pages about it. So, you know, you can go on Twitter and check his feed and check what he says about that. I found an interview about it recently as well. So it's a new way, another way of potentially using this new technology. Uh, 
at this point, I think, uh, yeah, creativity is just the limit because this is code at the end of the day. It's like whatever you can automate with that. So that's probably a lot of other things that we haven't thought about yet, but that will actually have a major impact in society. So that's it. Yes, yeah, t uh, totally. I, I see that we, we have a few questions, so we, we, we will try to take some of them and I will assign them as much as I can. Uh, so we uh, have uh, Dory, um, uh, who is asking, can a mini film video be an NFT? Uh, maybe maybe uh, for you, Pascal, you can, you can explain quickly that um, yeah, can a video oh, yeah. be an NFT? Oh yeah, I, it, it certainly can be, and maybe Paul, has something else to add to that, but yeah, why not? We agree that yeah. any any asset, any file uh, yeah. can become uh, an yeah. NFT. Just yeah. you just store it, in a, uh, you host it in a specific place, and you create a link to uh, an NFT platform like OpenSea, and you say, okay, the ownership of this yeah. uh, file is mine. Okay, so it works for video, for music, for three D. Yeah for uh, any 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 type of uh, file itself if it's like uh yeah a code um i see that people are talking about uh yeah the a platform for uh, nfts and uh, uh which expert should be should we hire as a band to create nft to our album luma so i'm sure you know plenty of experts you know could help agencies maybe is there agencies that are helping artists to understand what's happening in the nft world does it exist yeah. Uh, yes, absolutely. Actually, you have like uh, the um, management company of uh, Dead Mouse, uh, which is called uh, 720, uh, that offer services uh, to help artists figure it out uh, their Web3 and uh, NFT plan. Uh, so that's the a, a way to look at it. You can also, you know, uh, start working with more like marketing Web3 agencies. Uh, that will help you build a community. Again, when we think about NFT, there is three things that you know are needed for your NFT to be uh, successful. A is the community, uh, B is the access, what are going to be those, those use cases, and C, uh, the scarcity, like uh, the, 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 the number of uh, copies you're going to, to, to do with that. Uh, so you have agencies that help you uh, figure this out. Um, in terms of uh, revenue share, Web3, it's a very collaborative place. Um, when you have like a great idea, you can easily get some grants uh, from uh, blockchains um, because those blockchains, they really want to have as many cool projects as possible on their blockchain. And therefore they are financing uh, the creativity, which is a unique opportunity for every creator uh, today uh, to think about their career uh, you know, as a Web3 company. Uh, so this is an opportunity that I don't think, you know, is going to last uh, forever. Uh, and this is, you know, the, the, the opportunity now uh, to leverage that. So you can get some grant to develop your project. And then um, in order to compensate the people who help you work on your project, you can actually also add them uh, to your smart contract. So basically everybody is incentivized on the sales. Uh, and everybody can get like a piece of uh, the sales by being listed in a smart contract. Okay, okay, hey, uh, cool. I, I see a question for Paul, a client, maybe Paul asking, oh, how much does it cost to hire you? So how much does it cost to yeah to, to have you to 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 help an artist to to, to do uh, the legal work? Um, I know oh, people oh. people hate it when lawyers use this answer, but it depends. Uh, it depends on how involved I would be depends on the kind of NFT it is. But the way I work is I don't charge for somebody to come to me and say, hey, I wanna do this, this, that. I wanna create an NFT of this particular asset that I have and I wanna make it a limited edition and I wanna do this with it. Um, once I got my head around it, then I could discuss with that person you know, what I think they need from a legal standpoint and what it would cost. Um, there's another one here about what's to stop someone minting another artist's work as an NFT. Absolutely nothing. Uh, that's why there's so many lawsuits. Uh, and sometimes it's not intentional. Uh, there's, there's a lawsuit right now between Quentin Tarantino and Miramax Films over his film Pulp Fiction. He was wants oh, yeah. to mint. He's minting NFTs or wants to mint NFTs based on script pages that weren't in the movie but were original script pages and also some other items from the movie. And the question is, can he do that based on 
the contract way back when with, with Miramax. Uh, you know, since NFTs weren't contemplated back then, was it included in, let's say, the definition of, you know, digital assets, which I think are rights he retained, but that's what the contract says, digital assets. So that's an example of, of someone minting NFTs because they think they have the rights. But a lot of it is just ignorance. People still believe that if something's out there in the ether or on the internet, it's free to do whatever the hell you want with it. And it's not. So it kind of goes back to what I said before. Um, you know, if, if you want to close your eyes and jump in and mint another artist's work as an NFT, you might get a phone call or a correspondence from someone like me telling you you're violating the law and we're going to come after you. Nobody really regulates it except lawyers and the people who believe their rights have been ripped off. It makes sense. I, I sent, I found an article two weeks ago about, uh, it seems like a UK court recognized NFTs as legal property for the first time. So that's interesting. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of people, especially brands, are trying to register their marks so they can have them in the metaverse and be protected. And at first, the trademark office in the U.S. wouldn't register. Now there's over 9,000 applications for blockchain-related goods being filed for things like virtual real estate and, you know, for brands to be able to be protected in the metaverse. So it's not, so people just aren't using them, you know, for whatever. They're not using Nike shoes on their avatar without permission to, you know, have the swoosh, the famous Nike swoosh trademark. Uh, for that purpose, just to give you kind of a, a disparate example. Okay, maybe maybe to to conclude soon, uh, I, I would like to think about the future and uh, and maybe with you, Luma, uh, where we we think about okay, what's the next step for the industry? What will be the the big things coming? Uh, what should we look at in the in the NFT and music? Yes, well, so first, it, 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 it's all about like the Web3 technologies that includes virtual and augmented reality, machine learning, um, blockchain, smart contracts, crypto. They're all going to completely change the way our creators uh, create content, uh, claim ownership, and get paid for that. More than that, I think, you know, we are going to see that the Web3 is going to change uh, the internet. And I personally think that creators are the new um, entrepreneurs, uh, where creators digital assets are equivalent to tech products, where creators leverage their influence um, when companies spend advertising dollars and where utilities associated with a digital asset are the reason why for fans to consume. So overall, I think, you know, thanks to social media, creators have been able to become brands and they can now now leverage Web3 technologies, workforce and funds to build an empire around their brand without a middleman. And this is all the, 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 the promise of Web3, cutting the middleman. And so for me, I think you know, the future of the creator economy is that everyone can be a part of it, as long as you create content uh, that resonates with people. You are, you are talking about the end of the middleman. So this is the end of Hollywood that you are talking about? I don't think it's the end of uh, Hollywood because you're always, you know, going to have like you, you, super great IPs. It's just like uh, there is a shift in who can have access to, who can become an IP uh, and who monetize those IP. There is no more monopoly about, you know, that's the thing about Web3 is there is, <clears throat> you don't have to go, you know, through a company like Google or Facebook or stuff like this to exist. Um, there is no more monopoly. It's all about uh, collaboration. Um, they actually say like uh, in Web3, there is no competitors, there is only collaborators. So there is, it's, it's really a shift that any, any, anyone can become somebody. Uh, and we actually, you know, saw that in Hollywood because, you know, I believe like in LA, that's where you have like a, the, the, the biggest concentration of influencers, right? And influencers and Hollywood uh, co 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 cohabit. It's a different type of IP. Makes sense. It makes sense. 
Uh, I don't know, Béranger, how we should uh, end up the, the, this thing. I suppose it should be now <laughs> because we start a little bit late. So I, I continue a little bit after. But uh, uh, I guess that uh, we, we've been through the, the whole thing. Uh, I, I let you uh, end up, maybe, Béranger, if you want. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, everyone, for answering the question and these are interesting content. Um, yeah, we answered all the questions. And if people want to you know, look at this uh, webinar, later we're going to send a link because it will be posted on youtube and on our social media and everyone can share it also so you will find it again and thank you again for this very interesting um, uh, debate and uh, insights about blockchain and music industry um, i will keep in mind maybe louise marie um, uh, sentence when she says Thanks, for, thanks to social media, creators have become brands. And so this is part of the reason why now the creators have definitely need to catch up with this kind of technologies. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. And, uh, <laughs> voilà. Have a nice one, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for having us. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. See you soon.